Hello, everyone. My name is Elisa Sklar. I am the Marketing Director at GIS Planning, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar with Economic Development Online. We are very pleased to have as our guest presenter today, Aaron Brossois from Golden Shovel Agency, who will be talking about the new way to do economic development websites. And I'm going to just give you a little bit of background about uh, Golden Shovel. Golden Shovel views economic development as a creative endeavor. Um, they are critical for a region or community to attract and retain businesses. Golden Shovel combines technology and brand expertise with a unique regional model for successful collaboration between organizations. The agency believes that a unified focus between local and regional organizations is necessary for success, and that means sharing resources while respecting each organization's brand and expertise. The goals are more than just attracting and retaining jobs. It is also about saving time and money for the organizations involved. And our present presenter today is Aaron Brossois, partner and vice president of business development at Golden Shovel Agency, a Minnesota-based company specializing in web solutions for economic development. Aaron has over 12 years experience in economic development markets. He has developed cutting edge interactive work for communities all across the country. Aaron is a board member for the Mid-America Economic Deve Development Council and on the communications committee for the National Rural Economic Development Association. Aaron's work has won local, state, and national design awards. Welcome, Aaron, and thank you very much for joining us here today for this webinar. Thank you so much, Lisa. Today's presentation, we're going to be talking about the new way to do economic development websites, discussing some new models that uh, here at Golden Shovel we've been working on. Just want to say a special thank you to GIS Planning for inviting us to uh, give the webinar today. And uh, we've worked with them in the past on projects and uh, very successfully. So thank you. We're very happy to have you here. And I'll start off with who are we? which might be the first question. So Golden Shovel Agency, we do economic development websites that specialize on rural and regional projects. And we have two different types of products. One of them is called the Economic Gateway, which is a software that we developed for the creation of uh, the economic development websites that can be connected together. And the second one is Gatekeeper's social management software. And Gatekeeper is designed to handle the ongoing communications and the maintenance of the economic development sites. And so we've been to an awful lot of economic development conferences. I'd say just in the last year, our staff was over probably about 16 of them. And so we see a lot about what's going on in economic development, and especially a lot of the different strategies that um, groups across the country are applying. And so I'd like to start off to share a couple of the stories of things that are going on in rural America. And we find that oftentimes groups will attend like their state conference, or they might even attend a regional conference, but rarely do they know what's going on in the other states. And that's something that uh, gives us a unique perspective on the industry. And let me give you some examples. As we know, there's been a large population shift in rural America. And um, this shows a chart. This is from 2010 to 2011. You can see the counties that have gained population. Um, and then the, the blue colors were the uh, counties that have lost population. The white counties are the urban, or the white colors are urban regions. And you can see there's been a, long, a large shift. But there's some really amazing things that are happening in these rural regions. And I'll give you an example. Like in Brookings, South Dakota, where they just uh, brought in a Bell cheese plant, uh, they were able to create 450 jobs. It was very exciting uh, for them. However, uh, where they were struggling was actually creating housing, where in other areas of uh, rural America, you find that housing is plentifully available and it's the jobs that they need. So Brookings is in that scenario. We learned from Otomo, Iowa, um, rural community, southeastern Iowa that has a amazing laser optics program, one of three in the country. And they have talent there that's learning these skills and yet we find out that across the rest of the country it's hardly known. I really like Kalamazoo, Michigan. We had a chance to visit Kalamazoo for the 
Mid-America Economic Development Conference last year. And they have the Kalamazoo Promise. And the Kalamazoo Promise is that if you have your children in school there from uh, K through 12, that they will pay for you to go to college, pay for your kids to go to college. And that was an economic development strategy that they used that was greatly successful in attracting people to their region workforce. And then we have another example in Faribault, Minnesota. Um, amazing company there, Sage Glass, that's been developing glass that's now going into skyscrapers that allows for electrically tinted so that no longer you need shades. And by tinting the glass, it creates energy efficiencies um, just with a little bit of electricity. And they've gone through um, three different plants and with amazing success. And who would have thought it'd be in the Fairbolt, Minnesota? And then there's Texas. And I know um, a lot of the states that we've been working with, up especially in the Midwest, don't know about some of the benefits that Texas applies for their economic development agencies. And a great example is they've got um, for communities that are 25,000 or less the ability to, trend, to redirect their sales tax directly to their economic development department. And so you'll have small communities there, much smaller than the average communities um, upper in the upper Midwest that have $2 million and $3 million marketing budgets or economic development budgets. And um, I found that a lot of people say, like, some of the other states don't even realize that, that they're doing that down there. And what we realize is especially greater America, we just need to communicate more. That too often it's flown over. There's these great opportunities. There's these great assets that are available. But with economic development being done online, it's not necessarily being communicated. So a golden shovel, we believe that absolutely critical that there's some level of regional collaboration. Um, the only exceptions we've seen are in very large metro areas where they have enough brand name already and they have enough budget to be able to uh, support the region. But for the rest of greater America, uh, regionalism is going to be critical. And fortunately, it's not super easy. There are a few barriers to regional collaboration. Let me touch on a couple of those. First of all, there's the way things were done the last 20 years. Um, the rate of change is happening so dramatically that a lot of the economic development uh, policies, uh, programs, uh, even mindset of how it was done, that was applied through into the 80s, the 90s, early 2000s, has already changed. It was Eric Schmidt, uh, now ex-CEO of Google, who wrote, turns out every two days the world produces five exabytes of data. This is as much data as the world produced from the start of humanity until 2003. We're entering very, very different times. And unfortunately, um, many of the communities, the rural communities, aren't keeping up. They're not changing fast enough to keep up with the rate of change. And then there's the leapfrogging issues with uh, contracts. This has been a barrier to regionalism. And the idea behind this is that this is how you're building your websites now. Raise a big pile of money. Look and see what your neighbors are doing and see if they have uh, any new tools on their website that you might not have. Then you make a wish list of all the different economic development tools you'd like to see on your website. Then you contact a company, uh, economic development or website making company, whoever might be in your area, and they send back the tab. And they're like, look at this, we're going to build all of these items on your wish list. It's going to cost this. And you're like, wait, I only had one pile of money. I can't build all of those things. So what I want to do is prioritize them. I'm going to do a few of them this year, and I'll try to get some budget together for next year, which uh, rarely happens for the record. You launch a website, looks really nice, win an award, four years goes by, and suddenly Internet Explorer 30 came out and your website doesn't work anymore and you're embarrassed. 
They have to go raise another big pile of money to do it all over again. That's the RFP leapfrogging issue. And the problem with this is that when you're doing a regional, a regional project, that there's always somebody in the region that just spent that big pile of money to build something. So why and how do they participate in a region? There's politics. Um, we had this happen up in Minnesota where the government had shut down temporarily. And uh, that certainly can be a, a burden to regional collaboration. I like to throw in grumpy people. Because there's also uh, definitely people that don't want to participate or do not want to, uh, don't see a regional collaboration as a good idea. Um, or they just want to do their own thing. And um, that can be challenging for regionals, regional groups projects. But there's a really good case for why regional collaboration should be done. Let me just touch on some of the top pieces. One of them is that we know site selection is done regionally. We've been meeting with site selectors all across the country um, and we ask them, we say, where do you go to find your economic development information when you're looking for where do you want to move your business or move a business to? And they're telling us they don't necessarily go to the states because they have the data that the states have. And they don't necessarily go to the local groups because the local groups don't tend to have the accurate data. Or they don't necessarily have what they're looking for consistently. So they will go to the regions first, or the region that they want to be in, and then they work their way down from there. So you know that's where they want to start. And it used to be really easy. Um, back in the 90s, you just had to look really good, and then the people would find you. But it feels a little bit more like this now, where it's you're small, um, especially if you're in a, a more rural region or if you're in the uh, not next next to a major city that's recognized. Um, you're not people don't even necessarily know you exist. And we are a Golden Shovel Agency. We're based out of Minnesota, but we're a virtual company. And I like to ask the question, when you have people living in different places and you don't necessarily need an office, where does a virtual company exist? And I'd argue that a virtual company exists only in the communication between the people. And if we all stop talking about the company, it would disappear because there aren't hard assets. And I would like to make the case that a rural community with great assets that isn't communicating has disappeared. And that's what we're looking to solve. Here's the current scenario of what's going on in a lot of different states and regions. And the, the truth is there's a lot of communities, regional groups, and states that are building the same thing over and over and over again. They're paying multiple times for this for data, or they're building the same tools. Each group's building a calendar application, or each group is trying to build a new staff directory or some way to highlight the projects that they've done in their region. And the problem with it is, is not only is it expensive to build the same thing over and over again, and a bit of a waste of money, but when you do build things over with different groups, you end up with all these different tools, all these different interfaces and there just increases the learning curve across the entire region. And by being regional, we can provide some consistency. And um, not necessarily consistency in look and feel, since each organization has their own um, identity, but consistency in navigation on how the tools work and consistency on the data that's provided similar to like what GIS planning does with their own site location tool, Zoom Prospector. We have a success story to share. The first one that we had worked on was with a group called Northland Connection out of the Arrowhead, Minnesota. It's a very progressive group. And they um, had this problem to solve. You can see the circle around Ely. So in the county of St. Louis, it was a very progressive county in the state of Minnesota. They have accurate data that was current. 
Um, but Lake County didn't necessarily have the same data, wasn't consistent, and it was out of date. And so if some business wanted to move into Ely right at the edge of the county line and wanted to know, for example, how many welders were within a 50-mile radius, um, they were only able to see half the picture. And they recognized that and decided they needed to do something to present the whole region as a whole. And they did a, a fantastic job. We built um, Northland Connection, including it had eight counties, uh, the Duluth Superior MSA and 69 different communities inside and created a consistent look and feel for and consistent set of data for every single community within the whole group. And you were able to work your way from the top at looking at the whole region, which is the page here, all the way down to a local community. And it, it came with great success. Uh, it was highly awarded and um, they had businesses moving up into the region in the first year. But over time, one of the things that they were struggling with was that the counties and communities that were buying in still had to maintain and pay for their own websites also. They were pitching in on the regional, uh, the regional initiative, which is great, and they should. But for example, like the state Carleton County, despite the fact that they were putting money into here, they couldn't edit the pages about Carleton County on Northland Connection. So they had to still have their own Carleton County site. Plus they had information that they felt was important to their economic development initiatives on a local level um, that might not necessarily have applied in a consistent fashion across the other communities. And so um, in some ways the budgets start to get strained and that and the counties and cities have to make a decision, do I put the same investment into the regional project or should I take some of this investment, put it towards my site? And um, that's uh, the, one of the problems that we're looking to solve for the next solution that we created. And this gets into the economic gateway software. So the economic gateway starts with a standard tool set that you might be familiar with, with um, other economic development sites. It has a custom design, custom look and feel. You have a content management system that's easy to use and people can go in and, and make updates to their site. They can add pages, they can change the content, and they can get their reports. We also have a suite of economic development tools, whether it's incentives directories or projects directories, community profiles that are available through it. And one of the decisions we made while so building the economic gateway is that the a la carte option doesn't work because the ideal economic development site has all of these tools. But as I expressed earlier with the RFP leapfrogging issue, rarely can a group afford them all, especially a more rural organization. And so the economic gateway is designed not unlike the Zoom Prospector tool where all of the tools are included and our commitment is that as we develop new tools, they'll be included also. An um, example of that is we just launched mobile versions for all of our clients as an addition to the gateway tool set. But then the model gets more interesting when you start breaking it out. So here in this case, here's the regional model. And at the very top, you see the gray box is regional web portal. That would be the main regional site. And it has all of the tools and pieces that I just discussed. But then Within that region, you have various members and local sites. So it might be a county, might be a city in the region. Uh, sometimes it's a smaller regional organization. And the idea is that there's still a shared tool set. There's still the shared navigation. There's still shared data. But that each organization can still have their own look and feel and the ability to control their own sites and add and remove pages and be represented with their identity. How about that? We also needed to make sure that we could support current initiatives. And uh, this is just one example of Greater Gallup Economic Development Corporation where uh, we had worked with GIS Planning to incorporate their Zoom Prospector tool uh, effectively into the site. Uh, there's many states that are we're already incorporating this technology in the GIS tool. So we 
had to make something that would allow for the initiatives that are already in play to be adopted and not build a thing that would, a tool that would com compete with them. And I'd uh, recommend people definitely to check this out. And if, you have, if you're not familiar with the Zoom Prospector tool, it's fantastic. So here's some new regional communication strategies that we've developed. I'm going to walk through a few different case studies. Um, I'm going to show you an example of uh, four different regional projects that we're in the middle of or working on and have developed. The first one is the South Dakota Prairie Gateway. In this scenario, Prairie Gateway is in the northeast side of South Dakota and it covered about a 30 county region. And Prairie Gateway is the regional portal, but then within there, there were communities that could participate and they set up the structure so that uh, the portal would be set up, it would represent the whole region, and then anyone locally could choose if they wanted to build a site within it. So here's an example of the main portal. And here's an example of sites that are all connected to it. So we've got Fulton, South Dakota, Dual, and you can see they each have their own look and feel. They're very different looking, but understand that they're all connected and that the information can flow between them. It's the SMET. And then we ended up doing 11 of them. The total were within that region, uh, all working together right now. And as we were working on it, we were approached by Advantage South Dakota, which was a 50 county regional group on the east side of South Dakota. And this made for, because of the way that the gateway was built, because of the way we could share information, we could be able to create a unique structure where the regions could cross and they could share content and information and the various communities that were underneath them uh, could be represented fully. So you end up in a scenario where two regional organizations overlap but can take advantage of the structure all at once. There's a screenshot of that. So then we started getting into a, a slightly different model that we were able to develop for a Great River Energy and uh, other clients that had a lecture, distributive electrical cooperatives. And in this scenario, Great River Energy wanted to build an economic development portal that not only represented their G&T, but represented all of their member cooperatives, all the distributive cooperatives across the state. Uh, it covers about 90 some percent of the, the state and the counties. And so here we're able to build the home page, and this matches the look and feel of their actual website, although it is separated, it's a separate portal, so it's their economic development section. And then you see these animations flipping through, we're able to build the 28 member cooperatives underneath. And so each of these have their own look and feel. Each one matched the look and feel of the respective cooperative. And what we had found when we were talking to the cooperatives, that an awful lot of them had no economic development presence. Oh, some of them didn't have, most of them didn't have an economic developer. Some of them had community relations people, but all of them are players in economic development in the state of Minnesota. And knowing that the communication had to be done online, there wasn't any presence at all. And we found in some scenarios that you'd have a cooperative that was in a community with an economic development organization that didn't even know the other two people existed. It was like two ships passing in the dark. And once we developed this uh, portal, it opened up those types of communications where suddenly the cooperative, which had no economic development presence on their website before, suddenly had a place to recommend their economic developer to take a look at. It had the information, the data, um, and, it, and it now it resulted with them being on uh, the economic developer from the 
cooperative being on the board of the Economic Development Agency. There's kind of the full portal overview. All the different groups connected. And here's the ideas, powerfully leveraging the communication. So if Great River has something powerful to say about economic development or something interesting that they want to highlight, right now, and this is like most organizations, they have the ability to publish it out of their website. And by uh, posting regular information, they were able to be found in Google, which is where the, most of the searches are happening. But now, with all with the whole network of sites connected, Great River can choose to not just publish out of their site, but they can publish out of the member sites also. And so instead of saying their message loudly once, they're able to say their message loud, loudly 28 times. Or they can choose if there's a news story that's really relevant to maybe the northern half of the state, they were able to say, we would like to have the story here, but we also would like to publish it on these cooperatives and we would populate those sites through our system. And really what it comes down to with a portal, an economic development portal, is ongoing communication. Um, the biggest things that hurt economic development sites are when it goes stale, uh, when there isn't a latest news story, uh, where the last, we've seen all sorts of horror stories where you go to a site and the last posting was in April, or worse, last year, or the data is outdated in a dramatic fashion. However, if we do have ongoing communication through the site and through social media, not only does it make the sites more active and engaging and show users that um, you know, got your finger on the pulse, but it also influences Google greatly since it looks regularly to see when last updates were made. And a site that only makes an update once a month only gets indexed once a month and then loses some of its placement on organic search results in Google. So in order to keep ongoing communication um, a priority, we developed the second service, and that's the gatekeeper service. And this is why it was needed, especially in greater America. We recognize that economic developers don't have much time. And so often um, we have clients that have one, uh, one person perhaps working in it, maybe two or three, and the time that they do have certainly isn't prioritized on websites and social media. And we know that site selection is being done online. And we know that having ongoing communication through websites and social media affects that, um, but it's, it's difficult. It's difficult with such small staff. And so there's lots of opportunities being missed. And one of the things that, that we've done in order to, and I'll exp explain a little bit and give you guys some tips so that you can um, use some of these yourselves, uh, but uh, we found that maintaining the relationships with our communities is critical with this ongoing communication. Um, I have this really impressive arrow graphs on the bottom here. And the one on the left that's pointing downward is what economic development sites uh, contracts were like. And they are still for a lot of uh, organizations across the country. And it looks something like this. You build your website, you pay half down, and you pay half at the end. And then after the site launches, the relationship with the web company starts to suffer and the website starts to suffer. And the reason is because every time you need something fixed or updated, the web company will have to charge you to make those additions. And the relationship goes awry because you don't want to call them and get charged to have to fix something. And they don't want to have you call them because then they have to put their programmers back on fixing old problems. When Ideally, their programmers would all be working on the latest and greatest developments. So the arrow to the right, another fancy graph, is uh, our experience with this process. And that is, if we can build a system like the Economic Gateway where we can ongoingly add to it and continually develop it, um, and then create, think of it more of as a service as opposed to purchasing a product, then um, we're able to really have great relationships. And it's allowed us to uh, stay in communication every month with all of the communities that we're working with. And um, 
since our inception for building these economic develop gateway sites, uh, we still have all of the clients that we started with. And uh, that's been almost four years. And since we have the service in play also, that allows for us to help out in a lot of different ways. We can help add stuff to a website. We can change the website. Our promise is that the site that we develop when we first launch is going to be very different in four years. We're going to continually edit and change how it works. The ongoing communication allows us to leverage the other networks that are available. And we like to work with social media quite a lot. So not only do we have um, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, um, we've also used YouTube and uh, press releases, There's some great press release channels. Um, and all of these come into play. And they come into play in different ways. I would say Twitter has been great as far as press finding stuff, uh, picking up picking up pieces. There's quite a few economic developers using Twitter. It's different from coast to coast. A lot more Twitter users on the East Coast and the West Coast than in the Midwest. But there's more Facebook users um, in the Midwest. Uh, with economic development, depending on the goals that people are working forward, uh, working towards, uh, Facebook comes into play. Um, Facebook isn't a great tool necessarily for attracting site selectors, but it is a great tool for legacy recruitment when you're trying to get uh, people to move back to the community that had already lived there once before. And they'll connect to their community Facebook page um, more socially uh, than a site selector would, where a site selector would prefer to use LinkedIn to make their contacts. And so part of the gatekeeper service is identifying what are we going to communicate. It's great. We built this big network. We have this big communication network. We can say something very loudly, but what are we going to say? And so uh, we work to help identify some of these, some of the information, so whether it's key assets, uh, are we going to communicate about the workforce development? Are we just going to highlight current news that's going on? Uh, what about the target industries that we're focusing on? So then we have to ask ourselves, well, who is the audience? And um, there's a variety of different types of groups. You have the existing businesses uh, that are looking for retention and expansion. We have site selectors, of course, um, entrepreneurs, startups. The audiences that economic development people are working with every day. There's also the audiences like the community stakeholders, whether it be um, city council or the board or uh, other people in the community that use the organization and need to have awareness of it. So with the gatekeeper service, the first thing we do, and this is how I'd recommend um, doing your own social media communications, is set some goals. And we usually recommend setting about three. Uh, if you get more goals than that, it gets tough to um, achieve them. And if you get too few goals, uh, then then you're not necessarily going to be covering the bases that you want. And so here's some of the common goals that we've had with our clients, attracting new business, uh, business retention, entrepreneurs, uh, awareness of the organization. Oftentimes we find that the communities themselves aren't that aware that the economic development organization even exists. And then we'll take our three goals and we'll take each one and divine some strategies. And by strategies is that these are the types of things that we're going to post on Twitter and Facebook and write about on the website that meet that goal. And so here's an example. I just picked one of them out, business retention. So one of them is we might be highlighting business visits. So um, for an example, if an uh, economic developer is visiting a business to check in and see how they can be of assistance and they find out that uh, that business is creating an interesting piece to the new Mercedes. Uh, plating company or something of that sort. Uh, they can uh, highlight that. That makes for a really interesting story that um, other businesses in the community might not have been aware and the stakeholders and the other audiences. Highlighting success stories, great. Um, local incentives uh, that might be available to the businesses to take advantage of. Um, link reciprocity, sharing uh, just 
uh, sending some traffic back to the businesses that are in town or the legacy recruitment where you're talking to people that lived there once before. So those might be five strategies that we would choose uh, for the goal of business retention. And then what we do is we write that content with a six month focus. So we know that social media is about current news and we have to handle current news separately. Because we also know that in a rural community that there's only going to be so much change that's going to happen. So for example, if you have a business park that's inside your community, um, you're not necessarily going to have six more business parks in the next year. So instead, we know that we can focus on that asset and communicate it different ways. And so instead of just getting up in the morning and sitting down at your desk on Monday thinking, hmm, what should I post on Twitter today that's going to have an impact on my economic development strategy? Instead, we already have content that's written and ready to roll. So just for one business park, we might target a target industry. We might have a few different target industries and speak to, speak to them differently about various assets that are part of that park. Or some of it might be to the general public or to some of the other goals. But we can pre-write that content. And we like to look at it at six months. So in our case, we might post uh, two Facebook posts and two tweets um, every single week. And by writing these all at one time, it's easier to do because it's all around an individual strategy. And then we can strategically place the keywords that we want to be found in Google inside that content. Um, it's a little more difficult to do once again when you're sitting down Monday morning by yourself to type them in. Uh, we use Hootsuite, which is a great tool. I'd recommend it for uh, publishing because we can preload Hootsuite and each month we can look at it and choose ahead of time what posts we want to post throughout the throughout that month. And when we have our meetings with clients, we discuss those and decide, yes, these are the ones we want to post or we should change this or take that out. There are exceptions where we write something in advance, perhaps about a business, and that business uh, changed, like maybe it shut down or it was in a different scenario and is no longer good content. So we can still uh, filter that each month. And then we follow Google Reader and alerts to find current news and then put that in um, each month as we discuss it. So what might be going on locally in your area or what might we be able to um, know from, we already might be aware that this is going on in your state or this is going on in your region and we make recommendations of sourcing that information. And then of course putting together quarterly reports and analyzing the content that was posted. So, touch on what's the point again, and one of it is to be in the conversation, and the other one is to be found. And so, the latest uh, vision that we've been working on, and this is the last example I'd like to talk about, is a statewide implementation of this economic gateway. And this is the ultimate uh, plan for states, and we're starting this with working with Montana. And the vision behind it is that you have a state level, once again, with all of the tools we discussed. And then you have each of the regions. So here's uh, 10 different regions. And each one might have a slightly different look and feel and brand because regionally they have different target industries, they have different identities, and um, this tool is really designed to empower them. And then within each region, we make all of the local communities, each of the city and county sites uh, underneath them. So they're all connected. And in these, they, we'd start, we just have the design of the region uh, applied to them initially. And the, once again, this is to allow a state to be able to pro not only have a chain of communication up and down through the entire state, but it also allows for them to be able to control the, the consistency and accuracy of the data, which is a big problem for a lot of local level communities. And this creates for some pretty powerful control because now if the state of Montana has some latest economic development news that they want to post, they can post it through the state 11 regions and 50 other communities. And they can have the consistent data and it can be filtered to the specifics of that community as you work your way down. There's also the consistent navigation, 
across the whole piece so the tools work the same way. So a site selector's learning curve is minimized or um, other stakeholder or user. And then when we make maintenance and upgrades, we can do it across the whole system at once. And I want to highlight especially at the rate of change that things are happening, if a state develops a new tool or would like to see something um, implemented, it's no longer build it and then try to get everybody to join. You can build it and just implement it immediately and react to that rate of change much faster. And then this also empowers the cities and counties and the local sites so that they can contribute and they get access to their gateway sites. They can um, add content, they could add pages that matter to them and if they do post news or it at least will filter back up and they can recommend it to their region or they can recommend it to the state and then the states and regions can choose to publish that news um, if it's relevant to the region as a whole. And another um, option is like local communities can actually adopt their site right out of this model and they see for example a local community that's having trouble keeping their site with current data and with current news will already see that the that is flowing through the state system and will have the option that could adopt it and uh, make it their own and even put their own look and feel on it and it's a way to create a full network that really has a uh, as the, the whole state interest in mind I also note sometimes there's um, organizations that don't want to participate or they have a really nice website and don't necessarily uh, want to participate in the whole overall state. And so in that scenario, we can uh, work with that. We just a link over to their site, not a problem. We create a smaller uh, just representation of just the data and the news and not have a, um, any sort of competing site, but it still fulfills on the needs of the state to provide consistency. It was Clay Shirky that said, when we change the way we communicate, we change society. And these new regional models that um, we've been working on over here at Golden Shovel are intended to really change how economic development is communicated online and to empower um, all levels of economic development. So I just want to end with, uh, um, hopefully, uh, many of you will be over at the IEDC annual conference. Uh, we're going to be there. We have a, a booth set up. And uh, if you're out there, by all means, please stop by and say hi. So I'm Aaron, and we'll also have uh, John and Joni out there. So come looking for us. We'd love to, love to meet you and share more. So thank you. And uh, let's open it up for any questions. Thank you very much, Aaron. That was really interesting, very interesting approaches to uh, economic development presence online for organizations. Um, anyone who has any questions are free to type them into the question field and I can present them to Aaron. Uh, we have one here, which is, can you talk about the various audiences for an economic development portal? Yeah, yep, absolutely. And, um, you know, it's, the audiences we found have shifted depending on the different projects that we do. Um, once again, if we talk about, for example, Nebraska or South Dakota or Montana, they focus a lot on the legacy recruitment and bringing back people that have lived there. Um, they don't necessarily focus uh, as much on direct site selectors. Um, we had other scenarios where business attraction is the key goal and site selectors are the main audience. And um, we've had regions where that's all they're speaking to. Uh, so there's been different, uh, different audiences, but the audiences that I think get missed a lot, especially in uh, the more local economic development groups, are the actual stakeholders in their own community and um, the businesses in their own community, ironically. And um, as a major trend that's going on right now in economic development, and certainly for greater America, is um, almost 100% focus on business retention and expansion. Um, there's anything from micro opportunity, growing very small businesses and getting them to add one or two jobs, all the way to uh, um, the, the legacy recruitment and uh, tr making awareness of their own organization and helping businesses understand what the other businesses in town are doing so that 
when a business is thinking of moving into town and they do contact the community businesses to find out about the environment that they're communicating properly and consistently the message that the economic developer wants. Okay. Uh, what, what about the communities that have just built an economic development site or they like the one that they have and they aren't ready to make a big change? Right, yeah. And to be honest, we haven't done a regional project yet where that hasn't come into play. And so, uh, the, first of all, we have to respect that. Um, not everybody necessarily wants, ideally, everybody would be in the exact same place at the exact same time and all be very motivated to uh, effectively execute a regional project, but it just, it just doesn't happen. And so, um, we handle those a little differently depending on the model. You saw with the South Dakota Prairie Gateway model, there was a group that had a site already. We were able to just to link to it and would be a, a part of it. Um, if you get to uh, like the case of the Great River model, they didn't have any economic development presences yet, and so it was fresh. We did it. There are some uh, economic developers that are tied to some of the cooperatives that were already involved with large regional economic development sites um, or already had a presence they felt was was good enough, and so they aren't necessarily going to uh, just adopt the one that the that the portal is building. So in those scenarios, I will minimize the presence of the of that group inside the portal and then link over to their site and take advantage of what they were working on. But on the state example, um, that being, I think, the, the, the largest scale implementation, uh, the groups that are not participating, uh, certainly up, up front will, will link to them and then just make sure that latest news and that the data is still represented consistently from the state down. All the other information goes to the site that they have built themselves. Interesting. So there's quite a lot of flexibility, it seems, in how this can actually work. Yes. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I have another question for you, actually. Um, every once in a while, uh, we hear from someone that they're reluctant to put a lot of information or data about the organization online because they are worried that people won't pick up the phone and call them or contact them in some direct way. Can you speak to how critical it is to have data online, how site selection and, and business search works these days in terms of the design, best practices for design? Absolutely. Um, I think it's absolutely critical to have the data available. Um, a site selector is going to call only if you make the top of their list. And the only, if you think about it, like how the lists are created, let's say you have a spreadsheet and there's a factor on there that that site selector wants. And so they might go to a dozen different communities around the country to find that data. And they're going to put it all into their spreadsheet. They're not necessarily going to look at the chart that you've made and compare it to someone else's chart. They're just going to go and find what they can find. And if it's a critical piece of information or a critical um, deal breaker for that site, then they'll hit sort top to bottom. And if you had a blank in there, you're already out. You're at the bottom. The data didn't get put in. And you don't have to worry about getting a call because they're, they're not going to call. So I feel that um, that having more information is better and, and that the fear of a, a site selector uh, not calling is actually greater for not having the information than having it. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I think we've found the same thing. That's an interesting response to that. Um, one other question regarding the social media design that you do, which I, I think is really interesting. Um, some economic developers say that they don't do social media or use it uh, in term for investment attraction to get the word out about their organization because they just don't have the time. And we, we understand that, you know, the pressure's on, especially in smaller uh, organizations. You may be wearing many, many hats and doing a lot of things simultaneously. How important do you think it is these days to have a, a social media presence to get the word out about your location? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, it's... I believe it's critical to have one. Um, this is a this is a world where there's communication happening online. There's tools now that are regular forms of communication. There's different audiences using different tools, um, like we had spoke a little bit before. If it workforce recruitment might prefer Facebook. The news outlets prefer Twitter. Site selectors prefer LinkedIn. 
And there's all these different audiences that economic developers want to speak to and, and address, but they're all using the tools differently. I think to not have any presence is a disaster. That it's, criti that it's critical to show that you, at least you are aware and, and using the latest tools that are available. Not only does it showcase um, some progressiveness, actually, I would say at this point, your own moves would be a late adopter, so it'd be about just playing even, let alone showing progressiveness. Uh, but but beyond that, beyond the audiences and what they might see on on social media, there's also the activity that's happening online and the impact that that has on the Google search results and being found through through mediums that might not directly relate to the social media, like search engines. Interesting. So very important, in my opinion. Yep. <laughs> Good. Okay. So it's a matter of being found, but also, you know, you go fish where the fish are, right? If you want to find site selectors, you need to go where, where you know they're going to be. Uh, yeah. So. And I, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't say that being on social media is more important than shaking the hand of a site selector or mm -hmm. going out and meeting one of the businesses. And that's why we've developed some of the tools that we've developed and the, providing the service in the way that we're providing it to create great efficiencies around having a social media presence without taking up the economic developer's time, which is really what's the most valuable here. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent point. Thank you very much, Aaron. I think that is it for our questions. I wanted to thank you once again for being our guest presenter this month and for uh, you know explaining all these different things about new practices in economic development, uh, website design and social media usage. Thank you very much. This uh, presentation, as I said at the beginning, again, will be uh, emailed to you as a recording so you can review it, share it with colleagues, and of course, reach out to us via email and let us know if anything else occurs to you if you have any other questions. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, we'll see you at IDDC.